just want to welcome you to our Acts class. We're going to be studying the book of Acts for the next several weeks, and I'm glad that I have the opportunity and the privilege uh, to be the instructor for this, and I hope that I can make this as enjoyable as possible. Um, I've done a lot of teaching over the years. The uh, ideal way of teaching, obviously, is to be have a live audience in front of you. I'd rather do that. There's other ways of learning, though. You can read a book, and I like reading books, but it's hard to ask the author questions. It's hard to get feedback when you're doing that. I like to listen to audio tapes. I've done that. But again, you can't ask questions, and you're just kind of listening rather than seeing. I've done, and I've watched videos over the years. I've sat in classrooms, and I've taught in classrooms. Ideally, we would be face-to-face -face live. But I think the second best way we can do this is the way we are doing it now on video. So I'm committing myself uh, to this experiment. I've done videos before, but I want to be able to do a good job. And I want uh, the students to feel like they're, in a sense, not wasting their time and they're getting their money's worth out of this. My name is George Grace. Uh, I am the Bible Institute Director of North Star Bible Institute in Rochester, New York. <clears throat> I have been teaching the Bible now since about 1973. I've taught in our Bible Institute when it uh, began in 1975, and I've been teaching every year since then. So I'm somewhere in the 40-some years of teaching, 44 years of teaching Scripture. I've taught the book of Acts before. And I will, Lord willing, if I'm still around, I'll be teaching it next semester live in our Bible Institute. But uh, what we are doing here is not only giving those of you uh, in other places an opportunity to get the teaching, but we're building a little bit of a library here for some of our students that may want to take an independent study course, something like that, where they can view videos rather than having to have to be in a live class. So let me give you some introductory thoughts here. We'll be using the authorized version of Scripture, AV 1611. We will uh, not correct it. I am not a Bible scholar. I am not a language scholar, but I'm pretty good at reading English and understanding it, and I know how to use a dictionary. And so over the years, that's what I've done. I take the Bible. I believe what it says. If I don't understand it grammatically or if I do not understand a vocabulary word, what I do is I look it up and try to put it in the context, the biblical context in which it is found. So you'll see that I do that along the way. My um, notes, I hope that each of you have a copy of my notes. You'll note that the text of the Bible is included in the notes. And that's so that you always have the Bible or this portion of the Bible wherever you go. If you were to go off to a coffee shop and you wanted to just do some studying, you don't necessarily have to have your six-inch wide Bible or thick Bible with you. You could take your notebook here and you'll have the scriptures of the book of Acts with you wherever you go. I will be following my notebook uh, very carefully so those of you who are in classes, you were going to start in the beginning and we're just kind of kind of walk through the uh, notes that we have in, uh, in the uh, notebook uh, so that uh, you won't and I won't get lost. I will try uh, my very best to avoid getting off on rabbit trails, bunny trails as they're called. I don't want to waste time, but there may be times that I interject something along the way that I think is valuable um, on the particular topic that we're looking at at that moment. <clears throat> we're going to do about a 30-minute segment right now, and then I'm going to give you a break. And that will give you and the instructor, the facilitator, an opportunity to uh, do a Q&A, questions and answers, have a brief discussion. Maybe you'll want to take a, uh, a potty break, uh, get something to drink, whatever it is. And then you can extend that as long as you want and then we'll come back and we'll do another 30 minutes. We'll do another break. And then we'll conclude with a final 30 minutes. So we'll actually have about an hour and a half of instruction. We'll have about 15 or 20 minutes of questions and answers and opportunities for you to take a break. My goal um, in these first three segments is to get through the introduction in chapter number one. Now that may seem like, boy, we're going awful slow, but 
we're going to go at that pace. We have to go at that pace because the first chapter uh, really establishes the foundation for the whole book. So there are a lot of things that we will say in the first chapter that aren't necessarily found in the text, but they're background information and things that would be good for the student to know to be able to really understand what's going on in the book. I do like reviews. You'll find in my notes that I'll begin the next session with a review of the previous session just to bring the context up uh, and put you in context again. I like to take about the first five minutes of any presentation, maybe a little less, maybe three minutes, just to reorientate the student so you can pick up, we can pick up intelligently where we left off. I like to um, make sure that we understand the context and the flow of the story. Um, <clears throat> we're going to survey the book and we're going to get uh, just a, it, in initially here, we're going to get a general flow and outline of the book. So if you have your notebook right now, I'm going to ask you to open it to page number one. Now this, uh, this study is the result of a series of messages that I preached on the year of the disciple some years ago. So the original form of each of these is found in, in a sermon. So as you look at the notes, you may see that they resemble that rather than reading a commentary or a notebook that uh, someone else may have written or provided for you, just so you understand. And you'll notice in uh, the table of contents on page number one, all the way up through page six, that I've divided the uh, book up into about almost 200 pieces. Now, about 40 of those pieces are introductions to the message. So there's probably 150 or 160 topics or stories that we will look at when we go through the book. The uh, titles in the emboldened print uh, on each of these uh, sections really was the title that I chose for that particular sermon when I preached it in the year of the disciple some years ago. For example, if you're looking at page number one, uh, the first section there is Acts 1, 1 through 8, characteristics of true discipleship, the church, the first 35 years. So this was my introductory sermon and serves as a great introductory message to a, a teaching lesson. So when I approach this on Sunday mornings, I approach this as though I was uh, teaching a class like we're in right now. Now, uh, I'm kind of a preacher-teacher, so there's times when I got a little more preachy than teachy. That may even happen here, but because I don't have, I don't have you present with me, I'm not going to get that chemistry where I can see that the congregation is getting excited and getting involved in what's going on. So it's just me and a camera right now, and I don't think the camera's going to do a whole lot. It's going to sit there and just look at me and uh, show every mistake that I can possibly make during this time. But if you look at those uh, pages one through six, you'll see all the different sections that we've divided this study uh, into. And uh, in the end, there's a, over 300 pages of notes. And again, those pages include the text, all 28 chapters of the book of Acts, many other cross-references that are spelled out, printed out, in full and uh, 40 introductory statements just to try to help the student understand where we are going in each one of them. So why don't we do this? Let's go to page number seven. See how quickly we're moving through our notebook today? Page number seven. Again, this was the first <clears throat> and uh, opening message of 41, 42 sermons, <clears throat> excuse me, that I preached. I believe the year was 2000. In 11, if I'm not mistaken. But Acts 1 through 8, characteristics of true discipleship. That was our focus in this study, and my focus as we went through the book of Acts. What was the early church like? Um, things are different today. We live in a different time, we live in a different culture. A lot of things have changed, uh, although people have not changed since uh, the book of Acts was written. We know that. But um, I think our culture. 
uh, the environment in which we live. All of this has an effect on us. Uh, there are many things competing for our time. There's no question about that in uh, society today. And consequently, it could be and probably is true that the church has strayed somewhat or maybe even a great deal from the original model or the original intent of the church. So the purpose for these messages, these sermons, was to go back into the book of Acts and look at the real deal. This is the original. What was the original church like? The book of Acts covers about 35 years of history. So from Acts chapter 1 to the 28th chapter, we're covering about 35 years of time. And a lot of things happen in those first 35 years. And I believe the Bible is an instruction manual for life. And I believe the, bo the book of Acts is an instruction manual for the local church and for discipleship in the local church and evangelism and worship and all those things that are important to us as God's people. But let's look at the first uh, eight verses. <clears throat> and I'll read them out loud. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John, that's John the Baptist, <clears throat> truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That was a very intelligent question, and it says a lot about the theology of the New Testament, and it says a lot about eschatology too. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we'll stop there for the moment, and right there in the eighth verse, we get the general outline of, of the book of Acts. Initially, we're going to see the disciples in about the first uh, eight or so chapters. We're going to see the disciples in the city of Jerusalem. Now, they were told to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but they were also told to wait for the promise of the Father. So there is a waiting time that they were asked to engage in until they would be sent into all the world. But we see in those first seven, eight chapters of the book of Acts, we see this waiting time, and we see a lot of things. The day of Pentecost takes place, some miracles take place, et cetera, et cetera. We'll see that as we go through the text. So it starts out in Jerusalem, and then we go to Judea and Samaria. The gospel begins after persecution, the persecution of Stephen. The gospel begins to leave it is carried outside the city of Jerusalem, and we go to Judea and Samaria. And by the time we get to, of course, during that time, the Apostle Paul, who was called Saul initially, we see his conversion. And then in chapter 13, we see Paul and Barnabas commissioned by the early church at Antioch, not in Jerusalem, but at Antioch, to be sent into all the world to preach the gospel. And that's really what the remainder of the book is all about. It's all about taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Uh, some people have said the book of Acts never ends, and I understand what they mean by that. We today are living in what some might call Acts 29. We just see the foundation for all of this in these first 28 chapters, the book of Acts. And then what's taking place now is a continuation, hopefully, that's what we hope for, that's what we're striving for, of what has uh, taken place back in the book of Acts. Well, there on page number seven, I've made some uh, statements about 
uh, remember, this was a sermon series. Some of my concerns of what I see taking place in uh, the uh, church. And uh, if you want to go to page number eight, there's some comments over there, some things that I would like to direct your attention to. It says, third line down from the top on page number eight, today I want to speak on first century Christian discipleship. So I say that again just to remind, that's what we're looking at. What were the disciples of Christ, those who actually had firsthand contact with Jesus, and then their disciples, what were they like and what were their priorities? What were their strategies in accomplishing what God had called them to, to do uh, in their ministry? So my goal is through the reading, study, and examination of Scripture, specifically first century Christianity as it chroni is chronicled in the book of Acts, we can individually and corporately raise the bar in our commitment, performance, Christian growth, and maturity. Now you're taking a class right now and uh, you probably have a very strong uh, academic orientation or expectation for what we're going to do. And rightly so, you should. You'll be tested by your um, facilitator there, by your pastor. You'll be tested on what is said here. That will be up to him to decide exactly how to hold you accountable for the material. That is for sure. But uh, beside that, my goal is that this study will impact you beyond just the academics, that it will inspire you, that it will instill in you the, the uh, reality of uh, what Christianity was really like in the beginning. Who were these people? What motivated them? Uh, what made them tick? You know, those, uh, those types of phrases that we use all the time. What is it? that empowered them and moved them forward to accomplish so much in such a brief period of time. There on page number eight, there's some quotations uh, from uh, others. Uh, some of these are my statements. Some of these are quotations from others that I have read uh, over uh, time and incorporated into my notes. If you go down about two-thirds of the way, you can see it says the book. You see the short paragraph? The book covers about 35 years of history, and it teaches us the character, integrity, discipline, dedication, and commitment of these first century believers. The goal was to spread the good news everywhere at the expense of personal and financial risk, and they did. It's proven in this book. At the outset of the book, we see the ministry of the Twelve. They're called the Apostles, of course, minus Judas. They are the sent ones. That's what the Apostles were. That's what the word means, sent ones. They minister with, and among many others, who are called disciples, students or learners. That's what the word disciple means. A disciple is a student. A disciple is a person who is sitting under the teaching and leadership of a mentor, an individual who's kind of showing them, somebody more experienced, somebody more mature, that's kind of showing them the ropes, giving them information, knowledge, and strategies, and methodologies, and all of that. And we've all sat under people who were disciplers, or master teachers. So uh, the apostles, even though they were very uh, briefly experienced, they spent three years with Christ, they certainly had a great education while they were in his presence, and um, we see the apostles now teaching others what they have learned themselves. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse number 2, very well known when it comes to the issue of discipleship. So we're observing here raw, radical, unadulterated, first century Christianity, and we want to look at it accordingly. We're looking at disciples and discipleship. So if you go to the top of page number nine, we've we have defined the term disciple there from a Webster's 1828 dictionary. A disciple is a learner, a scholar, one who receives or professes to receive instruction from another, a follower, an adherent to the doctrines of another, 
All Christians are called Christ's disciples as they profess to learn and receive his doctrines and precepts. The word disciples, or a form of the word, shows up 270 times in the New Testament. It's a very important truth, a very important uh, concept that we need to get a hold of. Now again, in this first uh, message that uh, I uh, introduced this series of messages, you're looking at I, uh, a list of characteristics of the true disciple on page number nine. And I've listed them, and, I, and I'm going to go through these quickly because you can read, and they're pretty much self-explanatory. I'm guessing anybody that's, just about anybody that's in this class right now has got some background in what I'm talking about in biblical Christianity. Most new Christians walking in off the street don't sign up for an institute class or this kind of um, much more detailed teaching in the Word of God. It takes a lot of people some time just to show up on Sunday morning to get used to the culture and the, the teaching method and all of the worship and all that. So I'm going to assume to a great degree that uh, you know something. So I am not going to belabor the point in each of these, but notice these are things that I believe are characteristics of a true disciple. Identification with Christ. What do I mean by that? Simply this, that you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. You're not ashamed of being identified with him. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the first characteristic in my list is that you're not ashamed of being called a Christian. You're not trying to hide from the public, trying to hide your Christianity, you know, tucking your Bible under your shirt or, or under the front seat of your car or whatnot. You're not ashamed of being a Christian. Secondly, you are willing and you understand the importance of establishing biblical priorities in your life. Biblical priorities with regard to people, life, and possessions. You have to look at everything in life and weigh it in light of your discipleship relationship with Christ. What is really important at this time as a Christian? The third thing at the bottom of page 9 is continuing in the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We do not grow as Christians by listening to Christian music. Now, I'm not, I'm not against Christian music, frankly, almost of any kind. I'm pretty broad when it comes to that. But the Bible doesn't encourage us to grow in our faith by listening to Christian music or uh, by um, reading Christian books by authors or doing devotionals or things like that. Although I'm for all of that stuff, the, the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. John wrote in John 8, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Continuing or abiding in the word of God helps you and makes you is one of the components, the pieces of being a disciple of Christ. Then we've got at the top of page number 10, love for one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that ye have love one for another. That's the only thing that is said in the Bible that a lost person can identify true believers by this. By what? By our love for one another. Loving one another. That carries great weight with anybody and everybody. So we need to express our love. Now that doesn't mean we have to have romantic feelings toward people or we get tinglys every time we're in the presence of certain individuals. I believe love is an action word. And what I mean by that is love does something. Love does something. Love, God so loved the world that he did something. He gave his only begotten son. So when we have love for one another, we're showing not just sympathy, but we're showing compassion toward other people. We show love through compassion because we intervene in somebody else's problem. We come alongside them and we say something like, let me help you make this easier on yourself. 
let me take part of the pain, part of the suffering, part of the cost of this situation upon myself to make this easier for you. That's what compassion is. It's not just a feeling of, boy, you know, I feel bad for that person that they have to go through it. Well, what can you do about it? Is there anything you can do about it? That's where we show love. It also produces fruit. Disciples produce fruit. They produce other disciples. They produce fruit in their own life. They grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They do that. But they also produce fruit. Other individuals who come to know Christ as Savior or others who are discipled or enriched by your testimony, by your example, by your knowledge of God's word. And then we see the last thing, and here's a word that shows up many times in the book of Acts. Witness, witness. True disciples bear witness to the truth. Remember what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It follows, ye shall receive power and ye shall be witnesses. That's what the authority and the power of God is all about. It's to give us the authority of bringing forth the truth and the Holy Spirit power to take the word of God to other individuals and be witnesses. Every Christian, every true Christian is a disciple. Not all disciples are good disciples, are they? Our goal is to be good disciples of Jesus Christ. The history of the church and, the hist and the, our biblical mission can be simply understood in these terms. One person influencing another for good and for God and for Christ. We don't want to find ourselves after being saved for two years or four years or even longer, we don't want to find ourselves in a place where we have to learn the same things, or the basic fundamentals of Christianity over and over. That every time we read the Bible, it really seems like it's new, like it's been, I'm not even sure I ever read this before. We don't want to come to that point. We want to get familiar with God's word. And as we do, we will learn. It's kind of like a well. You keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into understanding theology and how God does things and whatnot. But we don't, we don't want to feel like every time we go to church, we're learning things for the first time from the preaching or we're learning things for the first time from reading the word of God. We haven't spent enough time. Hebrews chapter 5, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What follows also is a verse I referenced uh, just a few moments ago, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. This is probably um, as, as much as any other verse in the New Testament, a verse that really describes what discipleship is all about. And the things that thou hast heard, Paul speaking to Timothy, the things that thou hast heard among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Well, I'm going to take a break in just a moment, about uh, three, four minutes, I'm going to take a break. But I want you to look at this list at the bottom of page number 10, if you will. Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. He had a student, a child in his Sunday school class. His name was D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody wasn't the best kid in Sunday school. In fact, Mr. Kimball uh, says that he, in fact, there's a quotation on the next page from Mr. Kimball. He didn't have a lot of hopes for this young Moody. He wasn't really responsive. He wasn't the type of student that seemed like he was going to progress and become a great teacher himself. But Mr. Kimball led D.L. Moody to Christ. And in fact, the response of Mr. Moody was such that Mr. Kimball wasn't really sure if it took or not, so to speak. However, I want you to notice the list. From Mr. Kimball on the left, D.L. Moody got saved. These other men on that list, Meyer, Chapman, Sunday, Ham, Billy Graham, you may recognize some of those names. This is kind of a 
chain of individuals that as a result of Mr. Kimball's witness, all of these other people were influenced, impacted, or led to Christ by somebody in that previous salvation generation. On the right-hand side, you'll see Kimball led Moody to Christ. But here's another group of individuals that came out of that. C.I. Schofield, the Schofield Reference Bible. Lewis Berry Schaefer, he was the founder of Dallas Seminary. Walverd was one of the present presidents of Dallas Seminary. Dwight Pentecost wrote one of the greatest books on eschatology, Things to Come. Just died maybe two or three years ago. Taught till he was 98 years of age. And then I'm sure that many of you have heard of Chuck Swindoll. All of these men are in a direct line and a result of the witness of Edward Kimball, who was a witness for Jesus Christ. And ye shall be witnesses, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men, in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 19. We need to focus on intentional discipleship. What we do as Christians need to be, need, needs to be done intentionally, with fervor, with some chutzpah, if I can use that word here. But to, we're going to take a break right now. You can, uh, you can take a break and use this time for whatever is important. Some questions and answers, discussion, or just you may want to use a rest area or whatnot. We'll be back in a few moments.